Hey guys, so I'm doing a read aloud of Frindle by Andrew Clements, and this book was suggested to me by my little sister. She's in third grade, she's eight years old, so that's about it. And uh, yeah, and I'm gonna do the first five chapters, but uh, if that seems like a lot, which I understand com completely, uh, it's like 30, 35 pages. So if you wanna take a break in between, take a couple breaks, then come back to this, I'm, all, I'm, I'm cool with that, I'm still here. And then um, for a couple of the chapters, I have some discussion questions that I thought of. So I thought we could talk about them or you guys could think about them. And then just remember that when you're reading, so we can see how much we remember, how much we understand from the book. And yeah. I'm not the best with technology. This works. Okay, all right, chapter one, Nick. If you ask the kids and the teachers at Lincoln Elementary School to make three lists, all the really bad kids, all the really smart kids, and all the really good kids, Nick Allen would not be on any one of them. Nick deserved a list all his own, and everyone knew it. Was Nick a troublemaker? Hard to say. One thing's for sure, Nick Allen had plenty of ideas, and he knew what to do with them. One time in third grade, Nick decided to turn Miss Deaver's room into a tropical island. What kid in New Hampshire isn't ready for a little summer in February? So first, he got everyone to make small palm trees out of green and brown construction paper and tape them onto the corners of each desk. Miss Deaver had only been a teacher for about six months and she was delighted. That's so cute! The next day, all the girls wore paper flowers in their hair and all the boys wore sunglasses and beach hats. Miss Deaver clapped her hands and said, it's so colorful. The day after that, Nick turned the classroom thermostat up to about 90 degrees with a little screwdriver he had brought from home. All the kids changed into shorts and t-shirts with no shoes. And when Miss Deaver left the room for a minute, Nick spread out about 10 cups of fine white sand all over the classroom floor. Miss Deaver was surprised again at just how creative her students could be. But the sand got tracked out into the hallway, where Manny the custodian did not think it was creative at all. Annie stomped right down to the office. The principal followed the trail of sand, and when she arrived, Miss Deaver was teaching the hula to some kids near the front of the room, and a tall, thin, shirtless boy with chestnut hair was just spiking a Nerf volleyball over a net made from six t-shirts tied together. The third grade trip to the South Seas ended, suddenly. But that didn't stop Nick from trying to liven things up. Lincoln Elementary needed a good jolt once in a while, and Nick was just the guy to deliver. About a year later, Nick made the great blackbird discovery. One night, he learned on a TV show that red-winged blackbirds get this high-pitched chirp when a hawk or some other danger comes near. Because of the way sound travels, the hunter bird can't tell where the high-pitched chirp is coming from. The next day, during silent reading, Nick glanced at his teacher, and he noticed that Mrs. Avery's nose was curved, kind of like the beak of a hawk. So Nick let out a high, squeaky blackbird. Beep! Mrs. Avery jerked her head up from her book and looked around. She couldn't tell who did it, so she just said, shh, to the whole class. A minute later, Nick did it again, louder. Beep! This time, there was a little giggling from the class. Mrs. Avery pretended not to hear the sound. And about 15 seconds later, she slowly stood up and walked to the back of the classroom. Without taking his eyes off his book and without moving at all, Nick put his heart and soul into the highest, most annoying chirp of all. Beep! Mrs. Avery pounced. Janet Fisk, you stopped at this instant. Janet, who was sitting four rows away from Nick, promptly turned white then bright crimson. But it, it wasn't me, honest. There was a catch in Janet's voice, as if she might cry. Mrs. Avery knew she had made a mistake, and she apologized to Janet. But someone is asking for big trouble, she said. Oh, said Miss Avery, looking more like a hawk every second. Nick kept reading, and he didn't make a peep. At lunchtime, Nick talked to Janet. He felt bad that Mrs. Avery had pounced on her, 
Janet lived in Nick's neighborhood, and sometimes they played together. She was good at baseball, and she was better at soccer than most of the kids in the whole school, boys or girls. Nick said, hey, Janet. I'm sorry you got yelled at during reading. It was my fault. I was the one who made that sound. You did? She said, said Janet. But how come Miss Avery thought it was me? So Nick told her about the blackbirds and Janet thought it was pretty interesting. Then she tried making a peep or two and Janet's chirps were even higher and squeakier than Nick's. She promised to keep everything a secret. For the rest of Nick's fourth grade year, at least once a week, Mrs. Avery heard a loud beep from somewhere in her classroom. Sometimes it was a high-pitched chirp, and sometimes it was a very high-pitched chirp. Mrs. Avery never figured out who was making that sound, and gradually she trained herself to ignore it, but she still looked like a hawk. To Nick, the whole thing was just one long and successful science experiment, and Janet Fisk enjoyed it too. Chapter two, Miss Granger. Fifth grade was different. That was the year to get ready for middle school. Fifth grade meant passing classes. It meant no morning recess. It meant real letter grades on your report cards. But most of all, it meant Mrs. Granger. There were about 150 kids in fifth grade, and there were seven fifth grade teachers. Two were math, two science, two social studies, but only one language arts teacher. In language arts, Mrs. Granger had a monopoly and a reputation. Mrs. Granger lived alone in a tiny little house in the older part of town. She drove an old pale blue car to school every morning, rain or shine, snow or sleet, hail or wind. She had a perfect, perfect attendance record that stretched back farther than anyone could remember. Her hair was almost white, swept away from her face and up into something like a nest on the back of her head. Unlike some of the younger women teachers, she never wore pants to school. She had two skirt and jacket outfits, her gray uniform and her blue uniform, but she always wore over a white shirt with a little cameo pin at the neck. And Mrs. Granger was one of those people who never sweats. It had to be over 90 degrees before she even took off her jacket. She was small, as teachers go. There were even some fifth graders who were taller, but Mrs. Granger seemed like a giant. It was her eyes that did it. They were dark gray, as if she turned them on full power. They could make you feel like a speck of dust. Her eyes could twinkle and laugh too, and kids said she could really crack funny jokes, but it wasn't the jokes that made her famous. Everyone was sure that Miss Granger had x-ray vision. Don't even think about chewing a piece of gum within 50 feet of her. If you did, Mrs. Granger would see you and catch you and make you stick the gum onto a bright yellow index card. Then she would safety pin the card to the front of your shirt and you'd have to wear it for the rest of the school day. After that, you had to take it home and have your mom or dad sign the card and to bring it back to Miss Granger the next day. And it didn't matter to Miss Granger if you weren't in fifth grade because the way she saw it, sooner or later, you would be. All the kids at Lincoln Elementary School knew at the end of the line, fifth grade, Mrs. Granger would be the one grading your Mrs. Granger would be the one grading their spelling tests and their reading tests, and worst of all, their vocabulary tests. Week after week, month after month. Every language arts teacher in the world enjoys making kids use the dictionary. Check your spelling, check that definition, check those syllable breaks. But Mrs. Granger didn't just enjoy the dictionary, she loved the dictionary, almost worshiped it. Her weekly vocabulary list was 35 words long, sometimes longer. And if that wasn't bad enough, there was a word for the day on the blackboard every morning. If you gave yourself a day off and didn't write one, down and look it up and learn the definition, sooner or later, Mrs. Granger would find out. And then just for you, there would be two words for the day for a whole week. So this is a picture of Miss Granger. Mrs. Granger kept a full set of 30 dictionaries on a shelf at the back of the room, but her pride and joy was one of those huge dictionaries with every word in the universe in it, the kind of book it takes two kids to carry. It sat on its own little table at the front of her classroom, sort of like the altar at the front of a church. Every graduate of Lincoln Elementary School 
for the past 35 years could remember standing at that table listening to the stranger's battle cry. Look it up. That's why we have the dictionary. Even before the school year started, when it was still the summer before fifth grade for Nick and his friends, Mrs. Granger had already, was already busy. Every parent of every new fifth grader got a letter from her. Nick's mom read part of it out loud during dinner one night in August. Every home is expected to have a good dictionary in it so that each student can do his or her homework properly. Good spelling, good grammar, and good word skills are essential for every student. Clear thinking requires a command of the English language, and fifth grade is the ideal time for every girl and boy to acquire an expanded vocabulary. And then there was a list of the dictionaries that Miss Granger thought would be acceptable for home study. Miss, Miss Allen said, it's so nice to have a teacher who takes her work this seriously. Nick groaned and tried to enjoy the rest of his hamburger. But even watermelon for dessert didn't cheer him up much. Nick had no particular use for the dictionary. He liked words a lot and he was good at using them. But he figured that he got all the words he needed just by reading and he read all the time. When Nick ran into a word he didn't know, he asked his brother or his dad or whoever was handy at what it meant. And if they knew, they'd tell him, but not Miss Granger. He had heard all about her and he had seen fifth graders in the library last year, noses stuck in their dictionaries, frantically trying to finish their vocabulary sheets before English class. It was still a week before school and Nick already felt like fifth grade was going to be a very long year. So, yep, okay, so we're at the end of chapter two, and uh, there's a couple questions that I thought of. So one, just to be uh, a little creative, I thought um, we did see a picture of Miss Granger. I can scroll back. Yeah, this is Miss Granger. She even looks scary. Um, we saw a picture of Miss Granger, but I want you guys to try and just read, or flip back to the video, read, uh, the part of the chapter where we hear what Miss Granger looks like and we read about what she wears and everything. I want to see if you guys can try and draw your very own picture of Miss Granger just by listening and reading that first part of the chapter. And don't look at the picture in the chapter, it's cheating. And just think about from your mind, what do you think she looks like? Remember, she's short, and I think she wears the same outfit every day. She wears a blue or a gray outfit every day. And her hair is basically white. So just knowing those clues, how can we draw our own Miss Granger picture? And then another question I had was, what do you think Nick should do about his problems with Miss Granger? Because he hasn't even started fifth grade yet and he's already super worried because he's heard all these really scary things about Miss Granger. So what would you do if you were Nick and you heard all these things about this teacher you're going to have and you weren't in school just yet? So what would you do to maybe um, deal with having a teacher that scares you or a teacher that you might not like that much? So, yeah. And um, uh, yeah. And then one other question I had was just hearing how Miss Ranger treats her students and how she um, what her classroom is like, just from hearing that in the chapter. Would you guys, uh, would any of you like to be in Miss Granger's class? Because um, I don't know if I'd like to be in Miss Granger's class. But um, also, since you guys are around around uh, Nick's age, um, is Miss Granger's class anything like your own classroom? Do you think Miss Granger is sort of like your teacher, or is she the really opposite of your teacher? So I'm just curious. Um, yeah, so let's keep reading. These are just questions to think about. Um, chapter three, the question. The first day of school was always a get acquainted day. Books were passed out and there was a lot of chatter. Everyone asked, what did you do over the summer? Periods one through six went by very smoothly for Nick. But then came period seven. Mrs. Granger's class was all business. The first thing they did was take a vocabulary pretest to see 
how many of the 35 words for the week the kids already knew? Tremble, circular, orchestra, the list went on and on. Nick knew most of them. Then there was a handout about class procedures. After that, there was a review paper about cursive writing. Then there was a sample sheet showing how the heading should look on every assignment. No let up for 37 minutes straight. Nick was an expert at asking the delaying question, also known as the teacher stopper or the guaranteed time waster. At three minutes before the bell, in that split second between the end of today's classwork and the announcement of tomorrow's homework, Nick could launch a question guaranteed to sidetrack the teacher long enough to delay or even wipe out the homework assignment. Timing was important, but asking the right question, that was the hard part. Questions about stuff in the news, questions about the college the teacher went to, questions about the teacher's favorite book or sport or hobby. Nick knew all the tricks and he had been very successful in the past. Here he was in fifth grade near the end of his very first language arts class with Miss Granger and Nick could feel a homework assignment coming the way. A farmer can feel a rainstorm. Mrs. Granger paused to catch her breath and Nick's hand shot up she glanced down at her seating chair chart and then up at him. Her sharp gray eyes were not even turned up to half power. Yes, Nicholas. Mrs. Granger, you have so many dictionaries in this room and that huge one especially. Where did all those words come from? Did they just get copied from other dictionaries? It sure is a big book. It was a perfect thought grenade. Kapow! Several kids smiled and a few peeked at the clock. Nick was famous for this, and the whole class knew what he was doing. Unfortunately, so did Miss Granger. She hesitated a moment and gave Nick a smile that was just a little too sweet to be real. Her eyes were the color of a thundercloud. Why, what an interesting question, Nicholas. I could talk about that for hours, I bet. She glanced around the room. Do the rest of you want to know too? Everyone nodded, yes. Very well. Then, Nicholas, will you do some research on that subject and give a little oral report to the class? If you find out the answer yourself, it'll mean so much more than if I just told you. Please, have your report ready for our next class. Mrs. Granger smiled at him again, very sweetly. Then it was back to business. Now, the homework for tomorrow can be found on page 12 of your Words Alive book. Nick barely heard the assignment. His heart was pounding. He felt very small, very small. He could feel the tops of his ears glowing red, a complete shutdown, an extra assignment, and probably a little black mark next to his name on the seating chart. Everything he had heard about this teacher was true. Don't mess around with the lone Granger. Okay. So that was the end of chapter three. So again, I have some questions and uh, you can pause to think about them or if you know the answer or you have an answer to the question right away, then you don't even need to pause the video. But um, just things to think about. Um, for chapter three, have you ever used a teacher stopper to um, kind of distract the teacher or get them off task like Nick did? And the second part to that is, what was the teacher stopper or distracting question that Nick asked Miss Granger? And um, I'm trying to think if I have used a teacher stopper before. I think, um, I don't think I have, but I think it's really cool that there's something called a teacher stopper because it just shows how creative and how smart kids are at this age. Um, so let's see, also, uh, huh, I feel something else. Okay. Um, have you ever had a teacher who had like a nickname? Because I think if we see it's on the very last page of chapter three. So the nickname for Mrs. Granger is the Lone Granger. Okay, she's kind of scary. So have you ever had a nickname for a teacher, or have you heard of a nickname for a teacher at your school? And if not, then would you give your teacher a nickname? Because uh, That'd be pretty cool to have a nickname for a teacher. 
Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, let's move on. Okay. Chapter four. Word detective. It was a beautiful summer, September afternoon. Bright sun, cool breeze, blue sky, but not for Nick. Nick had to do a little report for the next day. Plus, copy out all the definitions for 35 words. For Miss Granger, oh, for Miss Granger. This was not the way school was supposed to work. Not for Nick. There was a rule at Nick's house. Homework first. And that meant right after school. Nick had heard his older brother James groan and grumble about this rule for years, right up until he graduated from high school two years ago. And then James wrote home from college after his first semester and said, my grades are looking great, but when I came here, I already knew how to put first things first. That letter was proof, that, that letter was the proof Nick's mom and dad had been looking for. Homework first was the law from September to June. This had never bothered Nick before because he had hardly ever had homework. Oh sure, he looked over his spelling words on Thursday nights and there had been a few short book reports in fourth grade, but other than that, nothing. Up to now, schoolwork never spilled over into his free time. Thanks to Mrs. Granger, those days were gone. First, he looked up the definitions in the brand new red dictionary that his mom had bought because Mrs. Granger told her to. It took almost an hour. He could hear a baseball game in John's yard down the street, yelling and shouting, and every few minutes, the sharp crack of a bat connecting with the pitch. But he had a report to do for Mrs. Granger. Nick looked at the very front of the dictionary. There was an introduction to the book called Words and Their Origins. Perfect, Nick thought. It was just what he needed to do his report. It would all be over in a few minutes. Nick could already feel the sun and the breeze on his face as he ran outside to play. Homework all done. Then he read the first sentence from the introduction. Without question, this modern American dictionary is one of the most surprisingly complex and profound documents ever to be created. For it embodies unparalleled etymological detail reflecting not only superb lexicographic scholarship, but also the dreams and speech and imaginative talents of millions of people over thousands of years. For every person who has ever spoken or written in English has had a hand in its making. What? Nick scratched his head and read it again. Then again, not much better. It was sort of like trying to read the ingredients on a shampoo bottle. He slammed the dictionary shut and walked downstairs. Nick's family did a lot of reading, so bookshelves covered three of the four walls in the family room. There were two sets of encyclopedias. The black set was for grown-ups, and the red set was for kids. Nick pulled out the D volume from the red set and looked up dictionary. There were three full pages with headings like early dictionaries, word detectives, dictionaries today. Not every exciting, not very exciting, but he had to do it. So Nick just plopped down on the couch and read all of it. When he was finished with the kid's book, he opened up the black encyclopedia and read most of what it said about dictionaries too. He understood only about half of what he read. He leaned back on the couch and covered his eyes with his arm, trying to imagine himself giving a report on all this boring stuff. He'd be lucky to have three minutes worth. But because Nick was Nick, he suddenly had an idea and it brought a grin to his face. Nick decided that giving this report could actually be fun. He could make it into something special. After all, Mrs. Granger had asked for it. Okay, before we read chapter five, you know what that means, questions. So my first question is, uh, at the end of the chapter, it kind of sounds like, or maybe you guys can guess for yourselves. I, I think Nick is hinting at he's going to do something with Miss Granger and his report somewhere here. And from what we can tell about Nick from the first chapter, he really likes to prank people. So what I think is ha what what I think the author is trying to hint at is that Nick might try and prank Mrs. Granger. 
and has to do something with his oral report that Mrs. Granger asked for. So my question is, knowing how Nick likes to trick teachers and how he likes to mess with them from the other chapters we read, what do you think Nick's prank is going to be on Mrs. Granger? Because I think we saw that he can basically do anything. He's made a tropical island in his classroom before. He's tricked his teacher by making bird noises. So uh, anything could happen. So I'm just curious what you guys think that prank might be. And then uh, the beginning of the chapter, we learned that the rule in Nick's house is homework comes first. And now I know that's a rule in my house because my parents are really, really, uh, really, really on me about homework and my sister. So I'm curious if you guys have any rules that uh, you also have in your house that maybe makes you similar to Nick. Like maybe uh, homework first is the rule in your house or maybe you have other rules. Another rule in my house is we have to make our beds, we have to fold our clothes, we have to do a bunch of things. But yeah, just things to think about and yep. Okay, chapter five, the report. By lunchtime the next day, Nick had a bad feeling in the pit of his stomach. Seventh period was coming. He was going to have to stand up in front of Mrs. Granger's class. The eyes of everyone in the class would be glued to his face and Mrs. Granger's eyes would be cranked up to maximum punch power. He looked over his notes again and again. The first English dictionary, the growth of the English language, William Shakespeare, words from French and German, new words, old words, new inventions, Anglo-Saxon words, Latin and Greek roots, American English. <sighs> it all became a big jumble in his mind. And his grand plan from the night before, in the harsh fluorescent light of the school day, it seemed impossible. What is it with the clocks in the school? When you're planning to go to the carnival after school, the clocks in every class practically run backward and the school day lasts for about three weeks. But if you have to go to the barber or go shopping for clothes after school, zip, the whole day is over before you can even blink. And today, after lunch, periods five and six went by in two ticks. As the seventh period bell rang, Mrs. Granger walked into the classroom, took four steps to her desk at the side of the room, flipped open her attendance book, and glanced out at the class and made two little check marks. Then, looking up at Nick, she said, I think we have a little report to begin our class today. Nicholas? Fifteen seconds into seventh period, and Nick was on stage. This lady plays for keeps, thought Nick. He gulped grabbed his crumpled note cards and his book bag and walked to the front of the room. He stood next to the giant dictionary on its little table and Mrs. Granger walked to the back of the classroom and sat primly on the tall stool next to the bookcases. She was wearing her blue uniform. Taking a deep breath, Nick began. Well, the first thing I learned is that the first English dictionary Mrs. Granger interrupted. Excuse me, Nicholas, but does your report have a title? Nick looked blankly at her. A title? No, I didn't make a title. Class, please remember to include a, little, a title whenever you prepare an oral or written report. Now please go on, Nicholas. And she smiled and nodded at him. Nick began again, looking right at Miss Granger. He said, the dictionary. A couple of kids thought that was funny, but Nick played it straight and just kept talking. A lot of people think that the first English dictionary was put together in the 1700s by a man named Samuel Johnson. He lived in London, England. He was real smart and he wrote a lot of books and he wanted all the other smart people to have a good dictionary to use, so he made one. But there were other dictionaries before this. The thing that was different about Johnson's dictionary was its size. First of all, he had over 43,000 words in it. The class made a bunch of noise at this big number. Ooh, and wow, and stuff like that. And Nick lost his concentration. He glanced up at Mrs. Granger, expecting to see those eyes drilling in a hole in him. They weren't. They were almost friendly, in a teachery kind of way. She shushed the class and said, go on, Nicholas. That's a fine beginning. 
Nick almost smiled, but he saw all of the kids staring at him. So he gripped his note cards even tighter and jumped back in. The other thing that Samuel Johnson did that was so special was to choose words he thought were most important, and then give lots of examples showing how the words got used by people. For example, he showed how the word take could be used in 113 different ways. Nick's report went on smoothly for 12 minutes. Nick was surprised at how easy it was to stand there and talk about this stuff. At the end of the first five minutes, Mrs. Granger had had to stop Nick again to say, Class, it is not good manners to yawn up loud or to put your heads down on your desks when someone is giving an oral report. No one in the class cared one little bit about the report, except Mrs. Granger. Every time Nick glanced up, she was smiling, and her eyes were not the least bit icy or sharp. She was eating this stuff up, listening and nodding, and every once in a while she would say, very good point, or yes, that's exactly right. But the next time Nick looked up, he saw Mrs. Granger sneaking a look at her watch. Eighteen minutes gone. Maybe his idea was going to work after all. Time for phase two. Reaching into his book bag, Nick pulled out the red dictionary he had brought from home, and the one most of the kids had, the one Mrs. Granger said they should use. Nick said, this is the dictionary that I use at home for my vocabulary work, and, and I opened it up last night to the very front, and right there, I found out a lot about how the dictionary was made, right in this book. So I thought some of the ideas would be good as part of my report. It says here, Nicholas. Nick looked up. Mrs. Granger got off her tall stool and its wooden legs made a screech on the linoleum. Heads snapped to attention and the class was alert again. Mrs. Granger smiled, raised her eyebrows and pointed at her watch. Nicholas, I think the, I think the class should read that at home themselves. Now, John's hand was up in the air and at Mrs. Granger's nod, he said, but I don't have the dictionary at home, Mrs. Granger. I have the blue one. And several other kids immediately said, me too. Mrs. Granger tried not to show that she was annoyed. Very well, Nicholas, but it shouldn't take too long. We have other things to do today. Nick kept his eyes open, wide, and nodded, adjusted his glasses on his nose, and began to read. <clears throat> Without question, this modern American dictionary is one of the most surprisingly complex and profound documents ever to be created for it embodies unparalleled etymological detail reflecting not only superb lexi lexicographic scholarship, but also the dreams and speech and imaginative talents of millions of people over thousands of years. For every person who has ever spoken or written in English has had a hand in its making. It was a long article and the kids were bored to death, but, one, but no one looked bored at all. Every kid in the room knew now that the period was more than half over and that Nick's report wasn't just a report, it was one of the greatest time wasters he had ever invented. Mrs. Granger knew it too. She had edged around from the back of the room to the side near the windows. Nick glanced up at her now and then as he read, and each time Mrs. Granger's eyes clicked up to a new power level. After eight minutes of Nick's best nonstop reading, her eyes were practically burning holes in the chalkboard behind him. There were only 10 minutes left in seventh period. When he took a break to start a new paragraph, Mrs. Granger cut him off. That's a fine place to stop, Nicholas. Class, let's all give him a round of applause for his report. The applause didn't last long. As Nick took his book bag and notes and sat down, Mrs. Granger's eyes went back to almost normal, and she actually smiled at him. Although your report was a little long, she paused to let that sink in. It was quite a good one. And isn't it fascinating that English has more different words than any other language used anywhere in the world? She pointed at, she pointed at her large dictionary. That one book contains definitions of more than 450,000 words. Now, wasn't I right, Nicholas? All this will mean so much more since you learned about it on your own. Mrs. Granger was beaming at him. Nick sank lower into his chair. This was worse than writing the report, worse than standing up to give it. 
he was being treated like, like the teacher's pet. And he had the feeling that she was doing it on purpose. His reputation was in great danger. So he launched another question. He raised his hand and he didn't even wait for Mrs. Granger to call on him. Yeah, but you know, I still really, I still don't really get the idea of why words all mean different things. Like who says that D-O-G means the thing that goes woof and wags its tail? Who says so? And Mrs. Granger took the bait. Who says dog means dog? You do, Nicholas. You and I and everyone in this class and this school and this town and this state and this country, we all agree. If we lived in France, we would all agree that the right word for that hairy four-legged creature was a different word. Shen. It sounds like, oh, she. It sounds like she and. But it means what D-O-G means to you and me. And in Germany, they say Hund, so, and so on, all around the globe. But if all of us in this room decided to call that creature something else, and if everyone else did too, then that's what it would be called. And, every, and one day, it wouldn't be written in dictionary that way. We decide what goes in that book. And she pointed at the large, the giant dictionary. And she looked right at Nick, and she smiled again. Then Mrs. Granger went on. But of course, that dictionary was worked on by hundreds of very smart people for many years. So as far as we are concerned, that dictionary is the law. Laws can change, of course, but only if they need to. There may be new words that need to be made. But the ones in that book have been put there for good reasons. Mrs. Granger took a look at the clock. Eight minutes left. Now then, for today, you were to have done the exercises beginning on page 12 in your Words Alive book. Please get out your papers. Sarah, will you read the first sentence? Identify the mistake and then tell us how you corrected it. Mrs. Granger jammed the whole day's work into the last eight minutes. A blur of verbs and nouns and prepositions. And yes, there was another homework assignment. And Nick didn't try to sidetrack Mrs. G again. He had slowed her down a little, but had he stopped her? No way. She was unstoppable. At least for today. Okay, so that was the first, first five chapters of Frindle. And uh, at last, last couple questions I have about chapter five um, that I want to go over. The first is, uh, I asked you guys in chapter four um, what you thought the prank that, or the prank or trick that Nick might pull on Mrs. Granger during his uh, report in chapter four, I asked you guys that. Um, and now my question chapter five is um, the prank that you thought of after chapter four, were you right? Did you think of the right, excuse me, did you think of the right prank? Because I I, I, I had a sneaking suspicion that uh, Nick's prank on Mrs. Granger would be another teacher stopper or a distracting question, but, um, this time it wasn't a question, it was uh, his oral report itself because he made it so long and so uh, complicated and like boring that it took up the entire class time except for eight minutes. And uh, that was really crazy to me. Um, another question I have is at the beginning we see that Nick is like really, he's really nervous to read uh, his oral report in front of the class before um, he gets to the middle and he starts to um, he starts to distract uh, the class and the time. But so my question is, has there ever been a um, time where you guys were nervous to read something out loud to your class or in front of other people? Because I definitely have that same uh, uh, problem sometimes. I sometimes get really nervous when I'm reading in front of somebody or I'm uh, doing some, or I'm reading anything in front of anybody else because I'm always worried, am I going to mess up or something? So yeah. And last, oh, last, my, my last question was about something that um, Miss Granger said. So here, let's go back. Yeah, so here. So Mrs. Granger is answering Nick, Nicholas's question, Nick's question about why for example, why is why does D O G mean dog? Like why why do we spell dog or 
Why do we mean the thing that goes wolf and wags its tail? Why do we call it a dog? So when Miss Granger says, um, when Mrs. Granger says uh, that dog means dog because we all agree, and she said that if we were in France, then we would agree that it means something else. What does that mean? Like, what did you like? What was your reaction to that? Because I sometimes think it's weird too. Like, why does why does some why does like an apple called an apple? Why is a banana called banana? And uh, yeah, I, that just got me really really interested. Um, let's see. I think that was it. These are all my books. Oh, I like this picture. I'm a big fan of dogs, so I really like seeing all these pictures. This kind of looks like this one kind of looks like my dog. He's uh kind of short, chubby, uh really hairy and black, um, with black fur. But yeah, and um so and in the next video we'll come back and start with chapter six. Hopefully you read uh the same amount or something close to it again. Uh, if this was a lot, you guys can always break it up into a bunch of sections, whatever works for you. Um, so yeah, and uh, I will make uh, the handout available, and the handout will have the same questions I asked, just on a sheet so you can see it better. And yeah, um, thanks for listening. Let me enter my screen. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, see you guys later. Bye.